How's it going, everyone? Welcome to this week's Q and A. So, like any other week, if you want a chance to one of your questions being answered, make sure you drop a comment down below. Just a couple of quick announcements. Obviously, I am back home. So uh, I got home uh, back Tuesday. Took me a couple days to get acclimated to the five-hour uh, time difference. So uh, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, but I am back at work. I went back immediately on a Wednesday. I've been posting content, and I had a couple of prologues waiting for me. Now the thing with the prologs is we only have one lift and one side of, uh, set of diagnostic tools. So uh, there's me and another guy that work on them, and uh, there's only one set of tools. So uh, you know we take turns, we alternate, we try to uh, prioritize uh, the ones that've been there longer, the ones with more serious issues and whatnot. Order the parts, then wait on parts, bring the next one in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, yeah, whole bunch of prologs. Uh, I'm gonna be doing a 1.5 T head gasket here at home. Uh, starting tomorrow. So by the time you watch this video, I'll probably be ripping that apart. I'm going to be trying to take a couple of shorts on a couple of points I want to make. So, uh, you know, I'll post them as I go on a couple of different days and stuff like that. I also made a couple of uh, memberships. There's two different tiers. If you want to go ahead and subscribe to those memberships, uh, that would be uh, completely awesome. We currently have two uh, members and there's again, two different tiers. One of them includes uh, early content and exclusive content for uh, all those members um, for both tiers. So if you want to see in-shop stuff that I don't post anywhere else, uh, that's where I post them at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern time, so whatever that falls for you. And with the tier two membership, you get access to uh, Discord, which you basically have me, uh, you know, about 12 hours a day or so. Uh, you ask me anything you want to ask me or whatnot. So again, if you want to go ahead and uh, join that, uh, you know, feel free. Uh, you can find that in the membership section. If not, then it's fine as well. Um, also I was thinking about making, uh, like a weekly cap or weekly review, maybe on like uh, Saturday mornings or something like that of what happened, uh, during the week, I could do either like a short video, uh, of just all the different cars I worked on and maybe like a post or something like that, or, you know, something along those lines. If you guys are interested in something like that, uh, let me know. And that would be a good way to kind of uh, cap and review the week. A lot of times it may just be maintenance. Sometimes it'll be some, some die-out work. So I'm not going to be getting into any details or depth, just kind of the cards I worked on, maybe some mileage. Uh, you know, throw some ideas out there, and I'll be glad to take anything into consideration. So that being said, let's go ahead and get started with the first question of the week. And it is, uh, this person has a, a manual uh, car, and they have a squeak noise coming from the clutch pedal. So this typically happens on older vehicles. Um, so if you have anything that's manual at some point, you have a chance of this happening. I've seen this a lot on the, uh, 03 to 07 Accords uh, for some reason, but also some eighth and ninth generation Civics, uh, where the squeak is actually coming from the, uh, pedal being broken and it's flexing. So as you're flexing it, the, or pressing on it, the pedal assembly is flexing and causing that squeak to happen. Eventually that pedal uh, assembly is going to break and uh, leave you stranded. So if you're starting to hear that, usually this happens uh, after the car is like maybe 10, 12, 15 years old or whatnot, um, and it'll happen, and you just take a look at the pedal assembly, press on it, and you see the whole thing flexing. It'll also feel a little bit weird. Sometimes you catch up on that, sometimes you don't. Uh, the thing is, these things happen in progression. So um, you know, if you compare the brand new pedal assembly versus a bad one, um, you uh, would notice it, but since it's a progression, it doesn't just snap off then you may not notice the difference because it's progressively getting worse. So if you happen to hear squeaking from inside the vehicle, uh, take a good close look at your clutch pedal and chances are that uh, pedal assembly is, uh, you know, cracked or splitting or something along those lines at some point. Now, as these vehicles get older, some of those parts may get discontinued. So you may have to opt to either A, getting it rewelded or B, for a used low mileage uh, unit that's obviously in good working form. But I've ran across probably eight or nine of these already uh, throughout my career. So if you're having one of these issues, uh, that would be the absolute first place I would look. So hopefully that answers this question for you. So the next question is a uh, brake bleeding procedure. What do I like to do? What do I do? Um, the question was, uh, do I prefer pressure or vacuum bleeding? And the pressure system does work better in theory, although uh, if the, the pressurized system isn't on the reservoir correctly, it can make a huge, huge mess. So I personally like to bleed it. And what I do is I go ahead and I drain the reservoir, right? Because uh, you don't want to bleed all that. You don't want to suck all that, uh, you know, old fluid through 
Uh, so I, I bleed it completely. I drain it out of there with my vacuum bleeder. Then I top it off with new fluid. And then I like to start at the driver's side front, then passenger side front, uh, and then the driver's side rear, and then passenger side rear. And my theory is you just want to get that old fluid, uh, you know, to the shortest point possible, right? So obviously the driver's side uh, front is going to be the shortest traveling from the, um, you know, the, the master all the way to that wheel. Uh, typically speaking, uh, sometimes it may be the passenger side. Really depends on where the uh, pump and everything is located. Uh, so, but driver side, whatever you want to do, it, it works either way. There's no problems with it. If you want to bleed the brakes or just drain the old fluid out of there, flush the system out completely. You can start at any wheel. Uh, what I would recommend for sure is, uh, you know, drain the fluid from the reservoir before anything and topping off the fresh fluid. You can also use the scan tool to activate the uh, ABS pump and just kind of break up some of that fluid in there, get that fluid out of there. So what I like to do is uh, drain it, uh, top it off the fluid, bleed all the four wheels, activate the pump, uh, drain it again from the reservoir, top it off once again, and then uh, bleed it one more time. And that usually works. Uh, usually I open, a, and I do this with a vacuum bleeder, uh, and I'll open up each bleeder about uh, two to three minutes or so, uh, maybe the first time, go five minutes, and uh, get everything as clean as possible. Now, chances are you're not going to get all the old fluid out but try to be as thorough as possible. And a good rule of thumb is every two years or every 30,000 miles. So hopefully I answer this question for you. All right, so the next question is, how many transmission fluid filters in an 18 CRV? So 18 CRV is going to have a CVT transmission. And all those CVT transmissions from that uh, generation have two transmission filters. So one of them is gonna be in the oil pan, and the second one is going to be behind the uh, trans uh, warmer. So uh, those in particular have two. A lot of the transmissions have at least one. Sometimes they are serviceable, sometimes they are not. So the ZF transmission, for instance, is not serviceable, but most Honda transmissions are serviceable, including a 10-speed transmission that a lot of people uh, say that there isn't a filter. There is a filter. If it has a trans cooler uh, or trans warmer, I should say, chances are it's right behind that warmer. You take out the three 12 millimeters. In the case of like a Type S where it has a, a cooler, it'll have that trans warmer, then it'll have adapter for the cooler lines, then it'll have a filter behind that. But uh, most transmissions do have a serviceable uh, filter. So if you have a question on one that may or may not have, uh, drop me a uh, comment and I'll answer it uh, for that particular vehicle. Uh, a lot of the older transmissions had an inline filter, uh, which was nice and easy to access. And at times we even saw them rust because they were exposed to the elements. So it is a better placement for them on the transmission or inside the transmission. But, uh, you know, uh, Honda keeps changing these things and adapting and improving them as time goes by. But for that a specific transmission, uh, those CVT transmissions, they do have one in the pan and then one uh, behind the trans warmer. So hopefully that answers this question for you. The next question is, uh, what is actually uh, failing on these hybrid injectors? Uh, and there's actually a new service bulletin for them. And what's funny is uh, nine out of 10 times, it'll never throw... Uh, a code for the injector it'll have like a misfire code or sometimes it'll have a very rough transition from uh the uh you know ev to the ice or whatnot so from the hybrid system to the ice engine will have a super rough transition uh, sometimes it'll even throw a transmission code so the bulletin is actually for a p0134 or a p0135 uh, it also may include a p0700 which is a transmission code that i was talking about P0300, which is random misfire, P219C, D, E, F, and P0172, which is a rich code. So a whole bunch of codes. Uh, and we kind of learned this from the previous generation that would throw uh, rich codes, lean codes, sometimes misfires and stuff like that. Uh, on a 1.5 Ts, uh, they would throw those codes. So anyways, what's actually causing a fail? A Honda doesn't really get into the description, but what we see a lot of times is, and I actually mentioned that in the... Um, bulletin is we see them as the vehicles turn off them just spraying out and they're just a little miss sometimes they're dripping but usually it's a little miss and it could just be a defective uh injector at that point or maybe some carbon even gets in there kind of gets stuck um and causing it to partially stay open i'm not exactly sure um but honda does seem to uh recognize this and has a bulletin which uh is bad for us technicians because the time to replace them, a drop significantly, and this is a kind of uh, a, no a normal thing when um, Honda, you know, has a bulletin out and had a, a previous, um, you know, warranty time or whatnot, labor time. Uh, they usually cut the time when a bulletin 
uh, is active. Uh, so we'll kind of see what happens from here. But for now, it is a 23 to 24 CRV hybrids. Uh, also the 25, but there's a VIN break on the 25. So at some point they figured out um, and went ahead and, you know, uh, addressed this. Uh, also, same thing for the Accord Hybrid, 23, 24. And then at 25, there is a, a VIN break. So um, I haven't looked into exact part number, but I'm assuming that we uh, they went ahead and either updated the injectors or something along those lines. Now, when they have a bulletin, usually the part number may be different because uh, it'll be a kit or something that superseded something else, or it'll be injectors with like the fuel pipe and everything included. Uh, so sometimes that'll change, sometimes it won't. But there is a bulletin for it. Um, I think a just normal warranty applies as of uh, for now. And but anyways, for the um, Accord, it pays a 2.2 hours. And then for the CRV, it pays 2.7 hours, which isn't horrible, but it is so much tighter to do those injectors versus uh, an older 1.5T that has uh, a lot more space. But it is what it is. So they are failing. Uh, Honda did recognize it. So there is a bulletin out. If you happen to have any of those codes or a front transition, chances are it may be, uh, you know, uh, an, an injector that's sticking open or something like that causing your issue so hopefully answers this question for you last but not least question of the week what are my thoughts on the uh, new prelude so um considering that i was a person who owned a fourth generation honda prelude so i had a uh, prelude si 9092 prelude si which uh came with a uh, 2.3 liter h23 uh, non vtec i later adapted a uh, h22 head and i had a h23 vtec which was a phenomenal car to drive. But anyways, um, it's a coupe. In my opinion, it's not gonna do well. It's a, basically a Civic Type R uh, suspension with a, a coupe, and it's just no room in the market for it, honestly. And I'm not sure why Honda is even bringing this. I don't know if it's a test dummy for, or a guinea pig for something else later on down the road, potentially or they just need to meet some sort of uh, criteria or check mark or something like that. But I, I think it's gonna be a major flop, uh, especially somebody um, who had a fourth generation Prelude. I've always wanted a fifth generation. Now we have the sixth generation here, which is, um, you know, I guess somewhat relative, but uh, not really because, you know, they can the Accord, um, you know, Coupe, they can the Civic Coupe because sales were poor. And now all of a sudden here we are with the uh, Civic Coupe uh, or Prelude Coupe, excuse me, that, you know, just really doesn't fit into the lineup at all, in my opinion. Uh, there may be some sales, you know, some nostalgic people may say, oh, the Prelude's back. And that's kind of how they're getting all these people with the Prelude, with the RSX, uh, with the Integra. I, although I do think the Integra was a good idea uh, because it was essentially, uh, you know, the Civic Type R or whatnot. Um, but, you know, I really don't have much to say. I guess we'll see how it performs. We'll see how it goes. Uh, I'm kind of disappointed. I wish it was uh, maybe... A prelude with uh, the Civic Type R powertrain. I think that would have made a lot more sense. It would have made uh, a lot more people happier. Um, but I don't know. I guess they have the reason. We'll see how the uh, how it performs. We'll see how it sells and stuff like that. Uh, let me know what you guys think. But uh, as a person who had one of them, uh, I would be highly disappointed if I was anticipating this coming out and then all of a sudden it's a hybrid. Not that hybrids are bad or anything like that. And I am a fan of you know the new Civic and stuff like that hybrid. Um, but you know it's just a coup me that. I don't have a, a purpose or a reason for to own a coupe, so I wouldn't even consider this car at some point. But maybe somebody who's been waiting for a coupe, maybe this is their, you know, segue into that. Um, but I guess we'll see uh, how it performs, and only time will tell. So hope it answers the question for you, and I'll catch everyone on the next one.